Rain and waterfall spotted inside China's tallest building. Video surfaced online showing water pouring down from leaking ceilings, soaking floors and offices. A new whistleblower steps forward at great personal risk. She says the Chinese regime knew about the virus long before telling the world. It's been over a week since China's Three Gorges Dam started to release flood water. An expert says the water speed is 25 times more powerful and potentially damaging than a natural flood. Chinese authorities took action to slow down the country's stock market. It comes after a week-long boom that fueled worries of a new bubble. Welcome to China In Focus, I'm Tiffany Meyer. An update on the unusual traffic accident in China reported earlier this week. Chinese internet users are speculating that a social injustice issue was behind the crash. Now, a local media report seems to support the claim. On Tuesday, a bus in China slowed down while driving along a busy road. It abruptly made a sharp turn, crashed through a fence, and fell into a reservoir below. Authorities say 21 were killed. Following the accident, suspicion about its cause arose online. A screenshot from Chinese social media app WeChat says the local government previously attempted to demolish the bus driver's house, a common occurrence in China when the government decides to use residence land for new projects. Chinese news media Caixin Weekly has since interviewed people who knew the driver. One resident identified the house where the driver Zhang Baogang lived. The neighborhood has also been demolished. Among what's left are piles of bricks, buried sofas, beds and televisions. The resident said Zhang had lived in the neighborhood for many years. Right before the incident, he had been living somewhere else, but still kept his old apartment. Zhang's house was demolished the morning of July 7th, the day of the accident. He rushed over after he learned of the demolition, but wasn't allowed to enter the area. Two hours later, he drove the bus into the reservoir. Days later, the neighborhood is blocked. Authorities also removed Caixin Weekly's report from the web hours after it was published. Now to China's floods. It's been over a week since China's Three Gorges Dam started to release flood water, as fast as nearly 2 million cubic feet per second. Water from the dam, as well as heavy rains, has soaked multiple cities located downstream from the famous Yangtze River. Chinese-German hydrologist Wang Wei Lo told local media that at the current speed, the water being released from the dam is about 25 times more powerful and damaging than natural floodwaters. <laughs> Online, one netizen commented, that's not a dam, it's a flood accelerator. Meanwhile, media outlet Taiwan News reported that concerns over the potential collapse of the dam have scared off a major Taiwanese manufacturer from investing in Wuhan, a city downstream from the Three Gorges Dam. Likewise, Delta Electronics refused multiple invitations to invest in the city, citing the dam's stability issues. The dam was built in the 1990s despite strong opposition from experts. The Communist Party hailed its construction as a historic achievement. The severe flooding has even damaged an 800-year-old bridge in southern China. Jiangxi Province's Rainbow Bridge was built in the Song Dynasty and is seen as one of the most beautiful bridges in China. The top of the bridge suffered extensive damages, but its base is still standing thanks to its clever anti-flood architectural design. The front sections of the bridge's base are pointed while the back sections are flat. Their shape allows it to spread the force of the water and lessen its impact. And even if one of the sections is destroyed, the others can still stand on their own. So far, Communist Party leader Xi Jinping has not spoken out about the floods. A resident from southern China told Radio Free Asia that locals are now enduring severe damages to their homes, buildings, cars and farms. Chinese authorities have yet to offer relief. Water from leaking ceilings soaked offices inside China's tallest building. The 121-story Shanghai building was completed in 2016 at the cost of over $2 billion. Videos circulating online showed water pouring down from high floors inside the tower like a mini waterfall. Office workers hastily moved computers away and covered others' belongings with plastic bags. Dripping water flowed onto the floor despite buckets placed around the offices. Elevators were also shut down. Later, the tower's management office claimed it was due to an equipment error within the building. 
Torrential rains hit eastern China early this week, prompting Shanghai to raise a yellow alert. Back in 2007, Chinese leader Xi Jinping, the then Shanghai Party Secretary, scrutinized the tower's design plans. He had stated that Shanghai Tower should be made a first-class project with green and smart features. But many Chinese netizens were quick to criticize what they considered to be a sign of poor workmanship, as is frequently seen in China. The latest whistleblower to come forward about the CCP virus at high risk to her own safety, Dr. Li Mengyan fled Hong Kong to expose the Chinese regime's cover-up of the virus pandemic. Speaking to Fox News, Yan gave a more detailed account about what happened in the early stages of the outbreak. Doctors in Wuhan knew about this new virus that could spread between humans. The local and national governments knew, but told the rest of the world there was no threat. Yen says she was one of the first to study the coronavirus. She said by the end of last year, her supervisor, Dr. Liu Poon, asked her to look into an odd cluster of SARS-like cases in China. Yen specialized in virology and immunology at the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong. She said the Chinese regime refused to let overseas experts, including ones in Hong Kong, do research in China. So she turned to her friends. One such friend worked as a scientist at China CDC and told her first-hand knowledge of cases coming out of Wuhan, a cluster of 27 pneumonia cases where the virus was believed to originate. She added that her friend told her of human-to-human transmission by December 31st. Yen said she recalls telling her supervisor this information, to which he just nodded and told her to keep working. Yen believed that as scientists, they had a responsibility to warn the world. But on January 9th, the World Health Organization released a statement saying there was a virus that can cause severe illness in some patients, but it's not readily transmitted between people. Yen said after that, a lot of contacts went silent, particularly in Wuhan. Others warned her not to ask for details. One source did tell her there was a massive spike in human-to-human transmissions. Yen said when she relayed that to her supervisor, he told her to keep silent and be careful. She added that he warned her not to cross the Chinese regime or they would get in trouble and be disappeared. Yen also says Professor Malik Pires knew about the outbreak and said nothing. He is a co-director of a WHO-affiliated lab. The WHO has denied allegations of a virus cover-up and of working with Yen, her supervisor, and even Pires. Yen told Fox News she fled Hong Kong because she knows how they treat whistleblowers. So who is Dr. Yen? In February, she was interviewed by Scientific American magazine's Chinese version and quoted as an expert on the COVID-19 vaccine development. She published several articles on renowned Nature and Lancet magazine about the CCP virus. The School of Public Health at Hong Kong University is famous for publishing several significant studies on the virus. Its infectious disease professor Guan Yi is one of the few outside experts allowed to visit Wuhan to do fieldwork at the beginning of the outbreak. The university has already deleted Dr. Yen's portfolio page. China made a move on Thursday to cool down its frenzied stock market. It ends an eight-day surge that was fueling worries of a new bubble in the making. Just last month, Chinese state-run media was pushing for the stock market to rise. But now traders say Chinese authorities think the boom went too far too fast. The Chinese regime took action on Thursday to cool down its $9.5 trillion stock market after an eight-day surge. A pair of state-owned funds announced they're planning to trim holdings for stocks that surged this week. It signals Beijing's unease over the rally's speed. Traders say it's a warning from Chinese officials that the equity boom went too far too fast. Chinese stocks added about $1 trillion in value this week, more than any other market worldwide. One Chinese state-run media warned about the dangers of a crazy bull market. Another reported that regulators asked mutual fund companies to cap new products. The cool-down suggests authorities want to create a steady bull market and not burst another bubble like what happened five years ago. That crash cost the Chinese market $5 trillion and affected millions of individual investors. Former CCP officials urged China to prepare for the decoupling of RMB yuan with U.S. dollars. But the solution he proposed to internationalize the RMB is considered to be absurd by some China affair experts. 
Former Chinese Communist Party official Zhou Li recently published an article urging China to prepare for the decoupling of the Chinese yuan from the U.S. dollar. The Chinese yuan is also known by another name, the renminbi or RMB. Zhou was previously the deputy head of the International Liaison Department of the CCP. Now he's working as a senior researcher for Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies, a think tank that works with the party. In his article, he blames U.S. financial policy for posing a risk to China's U.S. dollar-dominated assets. He adds that China is anxious about being cut off from the U.S. dollar-dominated SWIFT network, a secure universal method of transferring money from one country to another. Describing the situation, Joe said the U.S., quote, holds China by the throat, end quote. To respond to the potential decoupling, Joe proposes China boost its global use of the yuan and work to internationalize the currency. But statistics say the chances of that are slim. SWIFT system's figures show that Chinese currency accounted for only over 1% of international transactions in April. That's as the U.S. dollar made up 43%. But China affairs expert Zhao Pei says Zhou has it wrong. Zhao says it's important to clarify which of the two currencies is after the other. It's the CCP that had to couple the RMB yuan with the U.S. dollar because the party relies on the U.S. dollar's credibility to ensure the RMB's reputation. Former CCP official Zhou tells the opposite story. Zhao says the RMB is by no means an alternative to the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. That's because of one key concern, lack of credibility and the volume of RMB international transactions is also on the decline. International RMB circulations are very limited in quantity. Even the CCP built the system, nobody would really care. People would only use the system when they make purchases from China. What's worse, China-based foreign enterprises are not allowed to freely send money out of China. They're limited by a maximum cap on transfers. As early as 2016, the cap was lowered from 50 million U.S. dollars to 5 million. That's far less than what large companies need. The CCP doesn't want companies to leave China, but they're unable to exchange their profits from RMB into U.S. dollars because the RMB is not a freely convertible currency. What's the point of having a pile of RMB on hand? Another China affairs analyst, Jason Ma, says the RMB internationalization proposal is very unlikely given the poor state of the CCP's reputation. One incident quickly went sensational when over 80 tons of Chinese gold was found to be fake. King Gold Jewelry, one of China's largest gold jewelry manufacturers listed in the United States, pledged the gold to a number of financial institutions. It was an effort to raise about 3 billion U.S. dollars, but it was later discovered that the gold bars were actually gilded copper. About 80 tons of gold were found to be fake. That's a quarter of annual production, all fake. If even the gold is fake, can you trust that paper banknotes will be real? Ma says the regime added the final nail into its coffin when it forced its national security law on Hong Kong. The regime's credibility was completely destroyed. Putting together all of these factors, he concluded that there's no support for the potential RMB internationalization. Hong Kong's pro-democracy camp is having its primary election this weekend. The strongest candidates will run for the city's Legislative Council election this September. This as Beijing escalates its crackdown. But one candidate says Hong Kongers are not giving up the fight. And Didi's Juliet Song has more. Hong Kong's pro-democracy camp is welcoming its primary election this weekend. Selected candidates will run the region's legislative council this September. For one of the candidates joining the race, Calvin Ho, the upcoming election has great significance. I think the most important thing about this primary is showing that the pro-democracy camp is uniting together to fight against the totalitarian regime. The communist regime is tightening its grip on the region. Following the passing of a draconian national security law, some pro-democracy groups disbanded, some politically sensitive books were pulled from libraries, and one leading activist fled from Hong Kong. A government official warned that those involved in the primary election could violate the law. One day later, Hong Kong police raided the office of an election co-organizer. Under the tense political atmosphere, Ho said the upcoming election is a show of the people's will. It is to tell this totalitarian regime, also the entire world, how determined Hong Kongers' hearts are for democracy and freedom. Critics see the law as putting an end to Hong Kong's freedom. 
but Ho remains hopeful. This law is not making the lives of Hong Kongers more miserable, but is darkening the lives of the Chinese Communist Party. As you can see, more people are coming out to protest. After the national security law passed, Hong Kongers aren't backing off. The national security law is far-reaching, and analysts say the law appears to cover everyone on Earth. Under the law, even non-Hong Kongers that are critical of Beijing or Hong Kong government could be punished once they enter the city. You can see the totalitarian regime's fear. It is panicking, so it's attacking all enemies. Ho said Hong Kongers should be prepared to have a long-lasting battle with the regime doing every little thing they can, such as shopping at shops that support pro-democracy movements and sticking to their belief in their work and ordinary life. What the totalitarian regime fears the most is people protesting in their everyday lives. So Hong Kongers should continue the fight. Ho said the ruling party is cracking down on Hong Kong the same way it has cracked down on mainland regions like Xinjiang and Tibet. But he said it won't work this time, as Hong Kong is an international region and the world will see the regime's every single move. Sarah Liang and Juliet Song, NTD News. The U.S. is slapping sanctions on the highest-ranking Chinese Communist Party officials it's ever targeted. They say he's responsible for human rights abuses against Uyghur Muslims in China's Xinjiang region. The United States on Thursday slapped sanctions on the highest-ranking Chinese official it's ever targeted over alleged human rights abuses against Uyghur Muslims in China's Xinjiang region. Washington blacklisted Xinjiang's Communist Party secretary Chen Chuanguo, a member of China's powerful Politburo, and three other officials. Chen is widely considered the senior official responsible for the security crackdown in Xinjiang, where United Nations experts and activists estimate more than a million Muslims have been detained in camps. The highly anticipated sanctions followed months of increasing U.S. hostility towards Beijing over China's handling of the coronavirus outbreak and its tightening grip on Hong Kong. China has denied mistreatment of Uyghur Muslims and says the camps provide vocational training and are needed to fight extremism. The U.S. sanctions were imposed under the Global Magnitsky Act. The act allows the U.S. government to target human rights violators worldwide by freezing any U.S. assets, banning U.S. travel, and prohibiting Americans from doing business with them. Main exile group the World Uyghur Congress welcomed the move and called for the European Union and other countries to follow suit. Republican Senator Marco Rubio, who sponsored legislation signed by President Trump in June calling for sanctions over the repression of Uyghurs, told Reuters the move was, quote, long overdue and that more steps were needed. Another Chinese researcher has been charged for U.S. technology theft. This is the fourth researcher in the last 12 months the U.S. has indicated for stealing trade secrets and technology and sending them back to China. Song Guozhen, a professor researcher, has been charged with illegally using over $4 million in U.S. grant funds to help develop China's scientific expertise, particularly in the areas of rheumatology and immunology. He's also accused of making false statements about being employed in China while he worked at American universities, including Ohio State. He was arrested in May at a U.S. airport in Alaska while preparing to board a charter flight to China. Jin has been part of a Chinese talent recruitment plan since 2013. If convicted, Jin may face up to 15 years in prison. Now we look at the worsening trade relations between the U.S. and China. The CCP virus has largely impacted the U.S.-China trade deal. President Trump now says phase two of the deal is not a priority. Trump blames China for not stopping the spread of the virus. The relationship between Washington and Beijing has been severely damaged by the pandemic. Under the phase one deal, China committed to take steps toward improved intellectual property protections and stopping forced technology transfers. It also pledged to buy about $200 billion worth of U.S. goods over two years. But so far, it hasn't met its obligations. Now we turn to another of China's conflicts, this time with one of its neighbors, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan has labeled a Chinese claim as fake news. That's after the Chinese embassy in Kazakhstan issued a warning about an unknown pneumonia sweeping the region. The embassy called it deadlier than the CCP virus. 
Kazakhstan officials deny that there's a new virus on the loose, saying China's claim is fake news. In the UK, pressure on the foreign secretary to target human rights abusers in China under the UK's new sanctions. Our UK correspondent Jane Wirral has more. Welcome news for many this week from Dominic Raab. Here he's announcing the UK's new sanctions list that targets human rights abusers. So if you're a kleptocrat or an organised criminal, you will not be able to launder your blood money in this country. The sanctions, effective immediately, include travel bans and asset freezes. It targets a total of 49 individuals and organisations in North Korea, Russia, Burma and Saudi Arabia. The list, though, doesn't include human rights abusers in China, a point that came up several times. Could I just, however, raise one issue here, which is a remarkable silence on human rights violations in China. Rob, who was once a human rights lawyer, said the government is working on the next set of designations. So I'm very hopeful that we will see uh, sanctions against members of the Chinese Communist Party who have committed the most appalling human rights abuses taking place around the world at the moment. Notorious abuses against religious and ethnic minorities in China, including Uyghurs in Xinjiang, House Christians and Falun Gong practitioners are well documented. At a Wednesday debate in the House of Lords on the same topic of sanctions, this lawmaker asked about imposing sanctions on Chinese doctors involved in forcibly removing organs from prisoners in China for profit. Will proper consideration be given to the China Tribunal's conclusion about organ harvesting and might sanctions result? What are the doctors who may have been involved? The victims are mainly Falun Gong practitioners and evidence shows there's mass medical testing of Uyghurs. That's according to the final judgment of the China Tribunal. And the dramatic erosion of freedoms in Hong Kong, a former British territory, is also at the forefront of many legislators' minds. Several politicians have called for Hong Kong's chief, Carrie Lam, to be added on the mm. sanction list, haven't they? Mm. I think it'd be very difficult for Carrie Lam not to be included in that list um, because she has overseen a regime that has committed uh, human rights abuses, has broken down uh, China's responsibilities to UN declarations on freedom of speech. Going by Raab's response in Parliament, it's something he has not ruled out. Jane Wirral, NTD News, London. The Chinese Communist Party's draconian national security law for Hong Kong might affect the freedom of citizens as far as Germany. NTD's Arian Pazdar reports from Berlin. The Chinese Communist Party imposed a controversial national security law on Hong Kong on July 1st, a decision sparking outrage among Hong Kongers as well as globally. Observers say the new law makes any criticism of the CCP a crime, severely undermining the free speech of the people living in the semi-autonomous region. But Hong Kong residents are not the only ones affected by the new law. It might even limit people's freedoms wherever they are in the world. Article 38 of the law says that anyone who criticizes the CCP, no matter where they are, can be tried if this person was to travel to Hong Kong or China later on. We talked to a German citizen who received his bachelor's degree in Hong Kong. He was planning on returning to the city, but now says with the new law, this will no longer be possible because he has criticized the CCP online. I have shared a lot of content, also via social media, which is educational about the situation and, of course, critical. The content would definitely not be allowed in this way anymore. That's actually exactly the reason why I probably can't go back to Hong Kong. He said Germany should be acting as a role model to Hong Kong because free speech is one of Germany's core values and was critical during the times of the Cold War. And I think all the more you have to somehow open your mouth and say what's going on in Hong Kong. And the last thing I would do would be to delete any posts or not say my opinion anymore. Then I'd rather risk not being able to go back to Hong Kong. Another German citizen told NTD that Hong Kongers don't voice their criticisms anymore. She has lived in China and has visited Hong Kong ten times over the past few years. She asked for her name not to be used to guarantee her safety for future travel. It feels much more like the contact I had with friends from China, because most of the people I met in mainland China were by far not so critical thinking. Both of them agreed that the German government should do more to support Hong Kongers. They said that the government should care less about its economic profit and more about people's rights and freedoms.
Reporting by Arian Pazdar, NTD News, Berlin. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching. And to our viewers, starting this week, China in Focus will not broadcast on Saturdays. We wish everyone a wonderful weekend.